Uh, for you, what was the most profound discovery when you were writing Maps of Meaning? Was there one moment that really like obliterated everything? Well, I think I would say there was a couple. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 realization of the shadow in Jungian terms was very dramatic, you know, to to and that probably took about a year and a half to really fully integrate to when I started to understand that to you know to understand totalitarian malevolence, you have to understand the human proclivity for totalitarian malevolence. And that mm -hmm. means you have to understand your own proclivity for that. And it isn't intellectual understanding. It's it's different than that. It's 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 realizing that you could you could play the role of a Nazi camp guard. Right, right. You could do that. Right. You think you couldn't, and right. it would be more difficult for some people than for other people. I mm -hmm. I, I believe that, mm -hmm. but I don't think it would be particularly difficult for me. Right. So I mean, I sh I don't want to oversimplify that. It's like because I'm a compassionate person. Sure. But but I have a dark side. There's no doubt about it. Right. But. So that was very horrifying to realize. Yeah. It was also extraordinarily liberating because there, there's unbelievable utility in knowing you're a monster. Yeah, right. And the utility is is that you you develop some self-respect. Yes, sir. The same respect you'd have for a rabid wolf, you know. Yeah. Then that's respect. Mm -hmm. it, it, it might not even be admiration, you know, but and also it's it's also a tonic to self-discipline because if you recognize that you're you have a monstrous element, then you have all the more motivation for keeping it under control. And also being trained as a clinical psychologist helped that because, you know, I was increasingly exposed to literature and practical experience demonstrating to me just how out of control things could get in people's lives and how pathological their family and intimate relationships could become. And I, you know, I was quite highly motivated to avoid that. Sure. So that was one. Um, so, and then I would say the revelation of the opposite of that was also equally soul, what would you call, soul reconstructing maybe is the right phrase. Because one of the things that's really interesting about contending with evil is that you all, you instantly also begin to contend with good. Because the thing that's so interesting about realizing the reality of evil is that you simultaneously re realize the reality of its opposite. Right. And this is also something I learned from Jung, because for Jung, it was understanding of good through understanding of evil. He didn't think you could have the, the latter without the former. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that there was good and that it was actually more powerful than evil, that was really something, given how powerful I had realized evil was. Yeah, it's certainly. Like, They're all you know, material. My God. Yeah. So that was, that was well, that was eternally reassuring let's say something like that and i had some very profound religious experiences i would say spontaneous religious experiences while i was writing maps of meaning and they i heard about the music one yeah the music one was the most powerful one yeah. and that was that was while i was building that my, that piece of work piece of art that i called me the meaning of music that i use on most of my material which is a sculpture about six inches thick eight inches thick it's made of layers of foam core oh wow like, and I worked on it for about three months, and it was like I was—I knew I was building a Mandela, like the Navajo do with with rugs, and the Tibetans do with sand. You know, it was the same kind of contemplative exercise. But what I was trying to do was to understand what it what it was that music was intimating, mm -hmm. because music gives you a direct intimation of meaning, right. although it's nonverbal. It's like, okay, music is meaningful. Well, what does it mean? Well, you don't know because it's not verbal, and so, but it means something. Or maybe it's meaning itself, right. and music is magical in ways that we've only begin to come, begin to understand. Without and, and, so is, and so is the dance, I think. But yeah. I had a very, very powerful experience after I had made that piece of art when I was looking at it, meditating on it, and listening to music at the same time. It was as if the heavens opened up right, right in front of me and right above me. Really, it was very much like a renaissance painting you know where where you see these heavenly figures reveal themselves in the clouds like it wasn't that but if you had to represent it that's about as good as you could get at representing it wow. so and that was that was very hard to contend with to yeah. understand what that could possibly mean right. luckily i had a 
knew an old professor there, a guy named Frank Irvin, who unfortunately died a few years ago, and he was a extraordinarily interesting person, uh, very well versed in, in 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 neurobiology and neuropsychology, and he'd done a lot of studies of epilepsy, and we talked a lot about transcendent experiences and their biological basis, and you know he was a wise enough man to be a great scientist, but also to take such things extraordinarily seriously, and. He, it was very helpful to talk to him too, because it also helped me realize that I wasn't, that it wasn't a marker of insanity, say, which is, of course, when you have an experience like that spontaneously, that's the first thing that comes to mind if you have any sense. Right. So, right. so, so th- those are the, those are the, I would say those are the high points, so to speak, of yeah. of, of the experiences that I had when I was doing the writing. Yeah. 